Uh, you should be able to see this now, Primitive Methodism in Upper Airedale. Um, I've called it Upper Airedale, but really we're going to talk about Silsden. Uh, and I'm going to have to whip through these because I know that I've got about 40 minutes to get through uh, quite a lot of slides. Um, and we'll go straight forward. The real catalyst for all this is the organ, which is at Englesley Brook, hidden underneath the stairs. And uh, this came from Silsden. So Silsden really is the place that we're going to look at. Um, here's the topics that we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to go really back into the 18th century and have a look at the first Methodists in the area, because I, I believe that the history of PM really is the history, it starts really with the history of Methodism in the area. And that was quite important around here. And then we'll look at how PM came to Silsden. Um, the chapel in Silsden itself, so that we can get mixed up, of course, between the circuit and the chapel, but we'll look at the chapel itself. Who were the members at the, in the actual chapel in Silsden and what were their occupations and some of them in the circuit as well? And then, of course, right at the end, so you bring it back to uh, Anglesey Brook, the toy, tale of the organ um, as it uh, as it as it eventually appeared in the, in the, the museum. <laughs> First of all, we'd better tell you where Silsden is. Um, here we've got the West Riding Societies in 1763. Now this is getting on uh, pretty early in, uh, in Methodist history. You should be able to see all these little triangles. And near the top, we've got Keithley. And right at the very top, we've got Skipton. Uh, between the pair of them is Silsden. Uh, and within Silsden circuit, uh, originally there was Addingham, Sutton, Skipton, Silsden and Keithley. Uh, this is a circuit of the of the primitive Methodists. So we're looking at an area around up in that top left hand corner. But in 1763, the, this was the uh, Howarth, uh, what was called the Howarth Round. And basically it was a circuit of the Methodists uh, covering the whole of the area from where you see at the bottom near Huddersfield, right up to the Scottish border. So we're real, really looking at a huge round in the, in the early days. So really, let's go back to the early days. First person to roll into the area was Benjamin Ingham. Um, I'm not going to last long on these people because we've got a lot more to talk about. But Benjamin Ingham, he was the first person really to, uh, first minister to come around from the Church of England. He was a great preacher, terrible organiser. And he came into this area around about 1738 uh, preaching. Um, but he was, as I say, he was a dreadful organiser. Um, could talk a lot about him, but uh, in the end, he passed his societies on to the Moravians because he, he was useless at organising things and there was a lot of falling out. Um, but he pulled off the marriage of the year, 1741, married Lady Margaret Hastings, sister-in-law of the Countess of Huntington with a dowry of 5,000 quid. Now that in those days was pretty, pretty a lot of money. Uh, so he was, he was pretty well off and he could do what he liked from then onwards, apart from the fact that Lady Margaret Hastings no longer talked to him, nor her sister after that, because he was obviously much lower um, cast than uh, she would have liked to have as a brother-in-law. Um, then came on John Nelson. Uh, you may have heard of John Nelson. He ended up in jail a time or two in Bradford. Uh, he was from Burstall. He was a, black, a blacksmith. Um, formed societies which developed around Bradford and Keithley. And he first preached in Howarth in 1743. Um, so at the old hall in Howarth. Um, I won't go any further into John Nelson, but he was pretty instrumental in uh, running things to start with. And then we got down to the uh, Scotch Will, who was a, a peddler, uh, shoemaker. Uh, he set up societies around about Rossendale and over to Calderdale and Howarth. These are societies in those days were known as Methodists or Methodist type societies. It was a very loose sort of organization. Of course, Methodism in those days wasn't an organization as such in many places. Um, it was just people calling themselves that. He was a Calvinist, which of course didn't go out very well with the Wesleys. Charles Wesley thought he was much too um, uh, uh, rough and ready, especially his uh, his verses, which were appalling, uh, and uh, they fell out with him a lot. But they kept he kept coming and going within the uh, within the Methodist movement. And this was actually um, a, a barn that he used to preach in uh, near near um, uh, Todmorden on on the border between Lancashire and Yorkshire. And then along came the man who organised it all, which was John Bennett. Um, he took on Darnie's societies. I think Darnie was probably quite pleased to get rid of them. And in truth, he really founded the Methodism in the area. 
And of course, he married Grace Grace Murray, Wesley's intended, uh, which of course meant that he that there was a big fallout between him and uh, Wesley, John Wesley and John Bennett. Um, there's another long, long story um, about uh, Bennett. And of course, he became an independent and uh, is buried uh, near near Chinley in Derbyshire. Uh, but he started the first quarterly meeting of the Methodists in the country, which took place in Todmorden. Um, some people think it was the next person I'm going to show, which is William Grimshaw, who was a curate of Howarth and a friend of the Wesleys. Um, and he, among them all, was a bowlers preacher. He careered around the area, preferring to preach than do anything else, except that he did spend a lot of time in his own church in Howarth. Uh, uh, so he didn't uh, neglect his own locality, except that he didn't really live in Howarth. He lived near, Man uh, near, near Halifax, Halifax in the Calderdale. Happy Valley area, actually. Um, and he, the circuit was established around Keithley. And as I say, it stretched to the Scottish border. So we've got these big names going in the areas, setting up the societies, very, very earliest days. 1763, Grimshaw died. And this Wesley sent in um, a preacher, a, a superintendent to take charge of things. Grimshaw wasn't really good at organizing himself. Uh, and he sent in a preacher to, to uh, and so, several preachers actually, and we still have the membership records of the Keithley Circuit, which they call the Howard Circuit, but the Keithley Circuit from 1763. Um, this bloke he took in was a bloke called William Fugill, who unfortunately had a, a, a taste for young ladies uh, and, uh, and also a taste for the bottle. Uh, and he got slung out fairly quickly after this from the from the Methodist uh, uh, connection, but he was very very organised. And he, he, we've got both the circuit accounts from 1753, which was the date of the first quarterly meeting, and also the membership records, which Fugill got um, wrote, wrote wrote out, very much under Wesley's instructions. Now. This is the list of all the members of the Keithley circuit, really, which ran from um, uh, sat near Huddersfield to the Scottish border, society by society in 1763. And I've picked out the Silsden Society because obviously that's where we're going to talk about in the future. Um, I'll have to give you some idea about what's on this list because this in actually was a part of my uh, MA was this, trying to decipher what this a lot was all about. Obviously got people's names, We've got John Leach at the top there, that's leader. He was the leader of the society. To the right of his name, we've got a, a column which says whether they were married or unmarried. And for, fairly well down, there's a W for a widower. And um, Lambert, her name is, about fifth from the bottom. Um, what their trade was, farmer, spinner, servant, farmer. And we've got a good idea now of what the occupations were of the people in 1760 who took up... Um, uh, uh, Methodism, generally speaking, a lot of farmers, husbandmen, housekeeper, stuff maker, farmer, weaver, and so on. We've got a lot of those sort of people around. We've got something about their residence as well. Silsden and Brunthwaite, Brunfit as they call it. To the very left is a column, series of columns, four little tiny columns, which are um, uh, uh, confounded people what on earth they were uh, for a long, long time. And in fact, what they were, were the, the preachers uh, went round and this uh, list was made out every quarter. They would go around and inspect and talk to the members of each society and ascertain what their personal spiritual state was. And they would written, write them down. The nearest column, to the, the column on the right, which is the, uh, the closest to their name, was their first visitation one uh, one one uh, one quarter, and the little dot meant that they were justified. Uh, so they were sort of not quite the top uh, top level, but they were uh, pretty well um, justified within the sight of God. Uh, and and there were John Leach. He was uh, he obviously was visited four times, and he was decided to be justified each time. The third one down, justified first time, and then left. That cross says that they left. I don't think she died because others said died elsewhere. Um, others were not, not, not visited at certain times. They would be missing. The, what looks like a two is actually a question mark. Um, 
and in fact that says they were not were uncertain as to whether it was whether they were justified they were aware of their sort of depravity but they weren't justified in the sight of god uh and that sort of thing so that that was sort of the preacher's uh view of the spirituality of the societies now i'm not going to go on any further about this but apart from halfway down or just more than halfway down you'll see somebody called margaret flesher um and that, that name will crop up again obviously uh but margaret flesher uh, um is 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 a person that is to me of personal interest although i've not been able to find any relationship of her to anybody else but the name means something of course by the way here's the subscriptions and if you look halfway down the silsden uh, uh lady day they paid one pound 11 and six uh, sixpence into the society into the circuit and uh, and sometimes they've paid nothing other times they've paid a fair bit if we go on to that's 1764 1772 silsden doesn't appear but swarthy the fourth one up from the bottom is actually swarthy which is actually fairly close to silsden uh, and they were down to paying six shillings and nine shillings and three shillings so the society was in silsden was getting rather more impoverished getting poorer and in fact the membership was actually dropping so after wesley <clears throat> methodism obviously became more autocratic i'm going to go over this fairly quickly because obviously you will know this is uh, what was happening then this particular talk was really intended for a more general audience uh, originally but as well, methodism became automatic uh, more autocratic with uh, control in the hands of a select band of preachers and the aim for the aim of them with bunting and so on was stability impact of american war of independence and the french revolution they were very very concerned um about the impact of these uh, on the pop on on the view that the government would have of methodism generally and so they wanted to approve themselves uh totally reliable in the country and not thought of as sort of fifth column agents of the uh, americans or the french revolution um so uh, obviously ministers and lay preachers resented the changes and wished to return to the old ways and that was very much the case around uh, around Stilson and keithley this is a little cartoon which obviously appears in uh, in in books of various places and really we, this was obviously was a, a cartoon created by the new connection where the priests and the people who were thought of as being equal and the methodists on the, uh, the wesleyans on the left the priests were on the back of the uh, congregation and the congregation were on the back of the primitive methodists that was their, that was their view um and of course we've got hugh Bond and william Clowes coming into the scene um around about the beginning of the 19th century i'm not going to talk about that we're going to talk about primitive methodism coming into yorkshire of course it's spread up from staffordshire first nottingham and then with Clowes, it came to hull arrived in 1819 really and spread westwards from hull um and by 1821 <clears throat> the word about primitive methodism came to silsden and the instigator of this was john flesher if you remember that name flesher uh, from uh, that list in 1860s i can't but think that that lady was actually uh, related uh, to john flesher although john flesher was born in otley not not silsden and he was born in 1801 but fletcher is not a particularly common name fletcher is a common name but fletcher is not a particularly common name around here when he was a young boy his father william was a, was a school teacher and he moved to silsden and obviously john came with him although he didn't spend all his time in silsden he went off to school elsewhere occasionally uh he became a methodist lay preacher in his teens so he was a pretty um uh keen person to be a, to become a lay preacher in your teens strikes you as being uh, quite quite unusual to me um and then he, he had a friend also a, a young guy called john parkinson of he heights which was above silson on the hills above silson and he invited a primitive methodist preacher to come and preach in silson and the first service was held in march 1821 um flesher moved away very quickly to leeds um and this is flesher's cottage uh where where he uh where the, this is actually a drawing made of the first meeting uh in silsden uh in about outside flesher's cottage the sort of figures in the background obviously um uh uh 
clustered around the preacher. Uh, and the stream in the front with the ducks in the stream, quite a nice rural scene. It's actually in the middle of the village and it still occurs there today. Here's Flesher's Cottage in Silsden itself with ducks. I can't I guarantee that they're the same ducks, but uh, they have been there ever. There have been ducks on the river. Uh, there, there is called Cobbydale, by the way. Um, uh, the ducks floating up and down the street. This is actually in the main street of Stilson. Just uh, this is taken from the main road, uh, which is which is uh, runs through the village. It's a perpetual traffic jam, uh, but across the village, a nice haven of peace and quiet. Um, with that bridge, originally was known as Flesher's Bridge. It's been rebuilt, uh, but um, and that is known. It's got says Flesher's Cottage above the door. The two the two uh, cottages next door to each other. So this is really. Um, quite a pleasant scene nowadays. The Primitive Methodist Chapel, to, to be quite honest, um, was behind on the trees on the left-hand side, uh, on the main roadside, uh, just, just about 100 yards up behind those trees. So everything is clustered around in the same place. We'll go quickly on to John Flesher as a preacher. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, well, he w moved away to Leeds and became a school teacher and eventually became uh, a, a minister. Uh, he spent some time up in North Yorkshire and Durham, uh, and then he got sent up by uh, Clowes up to Edinburgh to sort out uh, a pretty dreadful state uh, of affairs in Edinburgh, where the, the whole congregation up there had actually uh, turned, uh, taken over the meeting room uh, and become Baptists. Uh, anyway, Flesher went up to, to Edinburgh and he sorted things out fairly, fairly well, so much so that uh, he got sent by Clowes down to London uh, to actually superintend the circuit down there, because London was always been a bit of a problem uh, for, uh, for, for as, as, a, as a branch of uh, uh, Hull, really. It was a long, long way away. And in London, he doubled the membership in 10 years, which is pretty good. Uh, and then... He became editor of the magazine and replaced Bourne. Obviously, these are the times when they were fed a bit of difficulty with with Hugh Bourne and, uh, and 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 Klaus weren't speaking to each other. Uh, and Flesher actually replaced Bourne as editor of the magazine, and eventually took control of the book room and took it down from to London from Bemersley. Um, uh, he became higher up in, in the organisation as time went on, and he spent his time revising this connectional rules. But, but he retired from preaching 1852 with a throat infection. <clears throat> he was only 51 at the time, so that was quite young, really. He got pretty heavily criticised by in a compilation of the uh, hymn book, um, which he he, I think the. People who liked the old ways didn't like him removing. This thing seems to be a modern thing anyway. People don't like changes to hymn books. They always like what, <laughs> it, always throwing out the ones that people seem to like, although whether, whether they do or not, I don't know. He died in Harrogate in 1874. Um, his wife spent most of her time complaining that he was never at home, by the way. Um, but uh, they, they sort of jogged along together. Um, let's go back into Silson now. The first preacher that who we actually saw on that photograph uh, painting was Samuel Leicester. He only came for a week or two, um, and unfortunately, he died uh, not in not not in Silsden, but he he went up to Darlington area and he died fairly quickly after after being at Silsden. So we know very little about Samuel Leicester. John Hewson came for a few months after that, but he he was then moved himself up to uh, North Yorkshire. Unfortunately. John Hewson, this is a bit of an aside, really. He he died in a dreadful accident in a colliery, not not down the coal mine, but he and a colleague were, were crossing over the railway lines of a cable um, operated railway um, in in Durham, and they saw the trucks coming down the hill, but never thought to look up the hill, uh, uh, down the hill to see the trucks coming up the hill, and uh, they got run over by a truck coming up the hill on these cable railways. Obviously, as a truck goes down, another one comes up. So they were they were crushed in a in a railway accident. Um, this sounds like a, a tale of woe, does this? Thomas Batty came in. Now he lasted quite a long time, but Batty is not really remembered so much about um, uh, about about his quite successful um, preaching in Silsden. But unfortunately, 
here's I'm going to read something from from uh, this book, by the way, which is a huge book, a, tr a tremendous book, um, Sills and Primitive Methodism by Robson. And uh, if you if you don't find anything out about Sills and it's virtually everything's in here. Um, but in September the 16th, 1821, this day, the ranters held a love feast in a warehouse at the close. And this is in Keithley, at the close of which the floor gave way when a scene presented itself beyond description. One woman died the day following and 40 were most severely bruised and wounded. So the floor collapsed in a warehouse that Thomas Batty was actually preaching in, in Keithley as he was starting to form the society down in Keithley. So that, that, that was a pretty um, dreadful sort of uh, 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 thing, to, uh, way to start uh, your uh, ministry. ministry. Um, here's a picture of Thomas Batty. Um, and he, he was obviously there for, for a year or two and was actually quite, uh, quite a good founder of the societies and really instrumental in getting them up and running in Stilston, Skipton and Keithley as well. By 1822, uh, Silsen, Keithley, Skipton, Bailden, Gargrave, Barnallswick, or Barlick as I call it, and Clitheroe added in 1823. This is getting to be quite a large circuit based around Silsden. They had five preachers. And as a comparison, Preston only had three. And if you look at the number of members, 625 in the circuit. That is that, that it, which had only started in 1821, but by 1823 they had 625 members. That is some growth. Uh, not most people would want some growth like that in any organization nowadays. Less than a year after the first um, sermon had been preached in, in Silton, they'd opened a chapel. Uh, with 200 sittings, opened on Christmas Day, 1821. It cost £350 and a debt on the completion was £300. I don't know whether the £350, of, I would imagine they paid £50 and still owe £300 of it. The membership was 50. So in Silsden itself, which is a village, probably only about a thousand people, um, they were already acquired 50 members and then enlarged it to 1845. And this was a picture of the first chapel in Silsden. Um, chapel Street, it's called, surprisingly. Um, and th that was the chapel. They managed to build that within a year of, start of the first uh, sermon being preached. So there was obviously um, some. And they obviously been 50 pounds have been paid towards it, but they were able to borrow quite a lot of money to actually build that chapel. And they, they were very fortunate in which they had three fairly well moneyed members. First, uh, this is on as George Barron. He was a nail maker. Now, nail making was the principal trade of Silsden, but it was going downhill very fast. That was handmade nails. Um, uh, a lot of people, in fact, if you go into the middle of Silsden now, there's a statue, uh, one of these sort of uh, municipal statue type things on the green and a picture of a broken nail uh, there, which, which reminds, reminds people of the original trade. He employed 40 people and he moved into clog iron manufacturer um, after uh, the nail making business went down. He eventually went to join John Fletcher in the book room and supervising the transfer from Bemersley to London. Obviously, John realized that he was a pretty good businessman because he was employing 40 people uh, and probably knew each other fairly well when, when they were younger so he he persuaded George to go down there and help with the with the actual book room itself but he didn't stay in London another guy was Joshua Fletcher started working life as an apprentice mill hand couldn't read uh, but he was a, converted by John Fletcher in 1821 and within a year, he'd learned to read, although he was never a brilliant reader. But he was on the plan by 1822, preaching 3,000 sermons in all. Um, and he he uh, was uh, was a tradesman in the in the village, quite quite wealthy tradesman. And James Gill, lime dealer, shoemaker, and grocer. Unfortunately, I've got a photograph. Eventually, built Bex Mill with Joshua Fletcher, the previous guy. So both of them built a fairly large mill, which has only just been demolished, and there's now housing going up on the site. He was the guy who bankrolled the circuit. I think most circuits require people who were bankrolling them, especially in that time. And it, in, in 1825, the circuit, circuit owed him about 65 pounds. So that's about 8,000 pounds a day. However, things were not 
uh, happy all the time. The circuit got into trouble. The circuit got deep into debt to James Gill and others as well. And when you look through the accounts, you keep seeing money that, that he had actually donated to the system, uh, either in debt or just given money to them. It was now smaller. I told about 625 members. It was now down to 151. Some of them because the society had, had now seeded off. But it was merged with Keithley, by which by this time was a separate circuit, which obviously part, really, partly um, uh, is the reason for that being now to 151. Um, however, they didn't like being merged with Keithley whatsoever. As you can imagine, being merged, having been a society, a circuit in which Keithley had been a member and now being merged into Keithley did not go down well with the local members. And they spent a lot of time trying to get the debt out of, out of uh, get themselves out of debt. And by 1830, they did actually cover it and it became an independent circuit. And in fact, by 1833, much to the annoyance of the people in Keithley, of course, Stilson was placed higher on the uh, on the list. Uh, at conference than, than Keithley was. So that uh, so the people in Keithley were not were rather upset about that, having sort of bailed out Silverton you know, previously. So the records, the financial records and the uh, uh, the meeting records of Keithley are, are quite interesting to read, um, which are in Keithley Library. They did have a few notorious persons in those days. And people were excluded from the society uh, quite regularly. They were fair, obviously very, very strict. Um, this, these are three of them. WF, I, I have worked out who he was, but I can't remember. Uh, I'm not offhand. He was a shoemaker and a local preacher, and he'd been getting money under false pretenses uh, from, from members and, and not paying them back. Uh, so he was, uh, he was excluded for obviously uh, embezzling people, really. Another one, WH for slandering JW and other preachers and members of our society. Uh, you can see there was a fair bit of under undercurrent of um, jealousy, no doubt, between uh, between various preachers uh, and members. I rather like this one, <laughs> HA called Muffin Woman for slandering preachers at Skipton and encouraging men to frequent her house and their gender disturbance of society. She bears a bad character. Uh, that was uh, somebody who was, uh, uh, I wouldn't like to speculate too much on what she was doing, but uh, she was obviously uh, um, uh, an interesting person. They also had a very indisciplined preacher and it was a woman preacher, Eliza Fletcher, her name was, in 1833. And it occasion uh, it 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 ended up with clouds having to come to Keithley, now come to Silton, to actually sort things out, and he wasn't very pleased. If I can find the uh, the, the reading, having gone from the last place to Manchester, I was met by Mr. James Gill, one of those three that I mentioned, who had brought a conveyance to take me to Silsden, a distance of forty miles to endeavour to settle some unpleasant matters which had arisen in the circuit. Though I was much jaded with labour, yet as the matters in question were peculiar and important, I accompanied him. After a tedious journey, performed in storms of wind and rain, we arrived in the evening, then assembled a committee and were enabled to settle the pending disputes at about 12 o'clock at night. On the day following, I left Sills and my journey was rendered, rendered somewhat unpleasant by having to sit behind an unmanageable horse and ride through torrents of rain. Um, I don't think I don't think Mr. Cloud that, that was only the second that was the second time he'd been there and I don't think he came again. Um, so he obviously he thought he thought Sills was OK on the first time, by the way, he came. Um, but um, uh, so he, he was he was not uh, most pleased about having to sort, sort this out. The members resolved that the disturbances re Eliza Fletcher be entirely done away and that she will be obedient to rule and the authorities of the circuit. I've never been able to really find out what she'd been doing. Um, the 1834 report, district report, said unpleasantness in circuit in consequence of us expelling from our society of misconduct a female preacher, which was Eliza Fletcher. 
she'd obviously been stirring things up. Now, whether it was uh, stirring things up religiously or had been actually slandering people, and uh, I, I wouldn't like to say, she may have decided that she was going to take people to stay down the Baptist route uh, as, and um, taking people away from them. But she was no doubt causing some real problems in the society. But notice, of course, we've got a female preacher here. We uh, They were employing female preachers. And they did employ female preachers, women preachers and leaders. I mustn't think we mustn't think that it was all men. Um, ladies did actually take um, part in the in the in the roles in the plan. On the top left is Ellen Page. She was a local preacher, uh, wife of a school teacher, um, and she and a girl, a woman called Mary Phillips often went in Han in tandem or preaching as a, as a pair and they were regularly asked to uh, to preach at um quite large affairs the, the sort of um, anniversaries in the area so they were not sort of the back row of preachers they were quite high up in the in the preaching uh, circuit then of course i've got uh, eliza fletcher um a troublemaker seems to have lasted longer than it was thought of in those from those those um uh, she was expelled in 33 as a preacher, but she still had managed to hold on. I rather like this, 1841, uh, in the report, that if the black woman do not come, Mr. T K takes Skipton. So that that's an extremely interesting thing that we've actually got um, a black preacher, a black, uh, black female preacher, um, uh, 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 assuming that's what they mean. Um, uh, but there's, there's no mention of actually who, what her name was. But um, we obviously have black pre preachers, black female preachers in 1841 uh, going around in the circuit. Um, then there's at the bottom here, on the bottom right, is Sarah Brayshaw. She was placed on the plan in 1831 and she preached about a thousand sermons. So, so she was actually from Addingham, uh, but that was it within the circuit. But she, she preached all around, around Keithley, Skipton, Addingham and Silson, of course. Uh, so once they were on the plan, they were around everywhere. So we have a fair number of uh, women preachers. And of course, they were leading the uh, Sunday schools and so on as well. Um, let's have a look at the congregation in Skipton. Um, this this one slide actually reflects fair, quite, a lot, quite a lot of word. I was able to identify 37 members up to 1842, basically out of out of this book. You take people who've done things at various times. I was able to identify as 37, and I could link 27 of them to the 1841 census, giving us the occupation of the householder. So if there were women who were marked down as house, uh, basically as housewife or that, that sort of thing, um, or in many cases in 1841, uh, occupations of any, uh, the only person whose occupation was given was actually the householder so that's the only way that you can actually identify what what uh, their sort of uh, social standing was most were working class but then that was the case of the whole population and there were members with substantial means i'll just go back to that it's quite um important to think about primitive methodism it, the, the usual thought about primitive methodism is, is it was a movement of the working people, but it, that wasn't necessarily the case in 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 uh, in Silson. <laughs> My view is what is that it was just the same sort of mix of people as the Wesleyan Methodists uh, and 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 any, anybody else around in the whole population as a whole. So if you go down the list of people, nail maker, nail maker, dressmaker, wool comber, wool comber, shoemaker, nail maker, nail maker, a twister in at the, wool, at the mill, wool comber, husband was a wool comber, nail maker, farmer, engineer, wool comber, schoolmaster, um, husband schoolmaster, farmer, worsted weaver, worsted weaver, farmer, wool comber, nail maker, coal dealer, nail maker, and dressmaker. These were people who were actually when it says nail maker, they could be one man working for somebody else or could actually, as with the uh, guy, uh, George Barron, could actually have a, a, a factory employing 40 people. It, it was not a movement which claimed to have attracted people because they were working class. The Silsden Primitive Methodists were people who became Primitive Methodists through religious 
um, means, re reasons, rather than just uh, following a, a revival process. They wanted revival. There were people who were, generally speaking, um, unimpressed by the way in which Wesleyanism was, was moving in the area or nationally. And they wanted something which went back to where they remember from the 1700s or their parents remembered from the 1700s, something which was primitive. Uh, and I think that is the way we have to think of the people in Silsden. This wasn't a, an organisation which went out to evangelise working people as such. It went out to evangelise everybody. And the cross section reflected uh, reflected that. And I think that's quite an important thing here. We're going to the rebuilding of the chapel. In 1845, it was reopened in August the 31st, but soon it wasn't big enough. 1846, it was reopened again <laughs> with even more seats. And this was the chapel as it had been rebuilt. Same place. It had been not the previous one had been sort of pulled down and rebuilt in the same place, was obviously a lot larger. Uh, and it still exists. It's now flats uh, or houses. Um, it's possible if you were to look very, very closely, you can actually see above the windows on the right above the door, uh, the door on the right. If you look closely at the windows on the top, you can see the rounded um, arches that, that, that uh, actually took um, the, the, where the windows have been filled in when it was made into flats. So this is a chapel that existed from 1845 through to about the 1890s when a new chapel was built um, uh, down in the village. Uh, closer to where John Flesher's house was. Uh, this this particular chapel still stands. The one that was rebuilt, uh, the one the new one that was built in 1897, actually has been pulled down and rebuilt. Actually, is now the Methodist Chapel in Silsden, and it's quite a thriving chapel. It's uh, quite 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 a pleasant place. Uh, I've given talks in there, and it's a, a very good place to give a talk. But this was a chapel in 1844 uh, from 1849 onwards. This is what it looked like inside. Um, benches for <laughs> the people downstairs, obviously, and a gallery, and a fairly large organ um, uh, with a singer's gallery up on the right. By the 1840s, we were now into uh, music. And of course, we now get back to the 1828 organ that is, that is at uh, Anglesey Brook. This is looking down into the organ. You could, uh, I thought, I'll show a picture of it actually looking down into the pipes of the organ. So it is not just a, a frontispiece. Uh, there are the pipes there and the tuning, uh, tuning of the uh, uh, tuning mechanisms of the organ and a nice chain to stop it all falling apart. Hugh Bourne was not very, uh, not very keen on music. Uh, well, it was, it's okay. But with great care and caution, it's probable musical instruments might occasionally be used without becoming a snare. So this is his view about music in chapels. <clears throat> Considerable firmness in religious people to keep clear in this matter. But whenever they have met any on whose life does not adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour, to play on any instrument in the congregation or to take part in leading, they may at once say the glory is departed. So he was laying the law down a bit. But... The people in Silsden bought that organ and they were rather worried that they might uh, raise the ire of the uh, connection, but nothing nothing came and the, the organ went in. I'll just um, leave that for the second. Uh, here we've got a, a hymn which is actually in uh, the, the first hymn book put in by Hugh Bourne. Hymns had passed from the uh, primitive Methodist tradition into the uh, Carroll tradition around Sheffield and West Yorkshire. I'll move on uh, because we're very close to the end now. This is uh, the organist um, who I think probably at the, at the end of that organ uh, be, uh, being played, Jonas Gill, James Gill's son, but he was a bit of an odd soul. Um, he went on strike <laughs> and kept the key. Uh, so he was obviously a fair bit of falling out. However, somebody made a wax impression and had a spare cut and, repla and replaced him uh, as the organist. Um, and when he was got, obviously reinstated, but when he got too old to play, um, he actually continued to draw a salary, uh, even though somebody else was actually doing the playing. So uh, things uh, were a bit uh, odd at the time. Um, I thought this might be interesting. Uh, this is uh, 
this is part of this organ was actually put up for sale uh standing in the, this organ standing in the primitive methodist chapel in silsden this is this particular organ in 1849 was actually put up for sale by an organ builder so i would imagine that they'd actually uh given a part exchange for this organ uh for the for the new organ that was being placed in that chapel or rather like the apprentice wanted at the end um so so, so they uh obviously put given given that organ to um uh, Mr. Nicholson in part exchange for that, that, that new organ, but I don't think he was able to sell it because um, it was possibly still kept at Silsden, but it ended up going to Bradley Primitive Methodist Chapel. Now, they might have bought it off him. Uh, I don't know. But it came back into Primitive Methodist hands in 1849 at Bradley, which was part of the circuit. That's nearer Skipton than Silsden, not very far away. Um, and then it ended up at somebody's house. Brad Bradley um, rebuilt their chapel, which looked very much like Silsden's first chapel in 1849. Uh, and uh, and it ended up in uh, Robert Laycock's house in Glusburn, I think it was. Uh, and then it ended up in his house, uh, Clifton Street, Burnley. Uh, and they heard that it was there. The people in Silsden heard it was there. Um, it came to the knowledge of the trustees that the old organ was in a private house in Burnley. Uh, so they wrote about it. And this is a reply. I received yours and in reply from the from Clifton Street, Mr. Mr. Laycock. Beg to say it's not even you in use for many years and is very much out of repair. But that is not its chief value to you. It was a gift from father and mother at Bradley and was very highly prized by me. I'm preparing to hand it over to you without price or money. But if you feel disposed to give a small donation to the Bradley Primitive Methodist Chapel Trust, I should be very pleased indeed. You would oblige if you could give me some idea when you will send for it, and they'll have it in as convenient a condition as possible. And they went went and actually uh, um, collected the organ and gave the uh, gave the message. They then sent it away to be uh, re, re repaired, and placed it. Um, in the lecture hall in Silsden. So it came back to Silsden in 1909. And there it is sitting in the lecture hall that they had in the, above the Sunday school in Silsden in 1909. So you can see the organ sitting in the corner there. And they actually played it for the Sunday school. And I don't know when it actually um, uh, came back in, into the hands of the, uh, uh, of the uh, museum, but it was part of, uh, uh, it was part of, uh, um, the the, the uh, agreement that, that they would have it that it would either stay in Stilson or if that was not the case that it would be put into the Museum of Primitive Methodism as it happened to be in London at the time. Uh, so so uh, at some future day it was sent forward to the Museum of Primitive Methodist Antiquities at our headquarters in London and after, after a, a month or so Mr Laycock the donor died. Um, so there it is in Stilson, and I presume when the Sunday school building was demolished, and I don't really know when that was, it's out of some, sort of my time of interest, or not say interest, but uh, times I've actually studied, um, the, the organ came into the hands of the uh, of the museum, and there it sits now in a Tanglesey Brook in uh, quite a splendid situation, I think. Thanks very much. I think that's the end. Lovely. Thank you. Okay.